Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the adrenoceptors. Okay, so we've discussed that there are nine currently known adrenoceptors, with potentially a few more that are more putative. These are the ones which we are sure exist. There is, for instance, a beta uh, 4 receptor that's very putative. Okay, so, um, basically, um, we're going to treat all of these alpha-1 receptors as one, basically, because as far as we can tell so far, they all seem to activate the same thing. Their localization is pretty much the same, uh, so we'll treat them all together, okay? Uh, then the same for the alpha-2 receptors, okay? Right. Um, now, one thing I do just want to discuss quickly is the different affinity uh, that um, adrenaline and noradrenaline have for these different receptors. Okay, so basically what I want to tell you is for each one of these receptors, which of the two catecholamines, noradrenaline and adrenaline, has the greater affinity for the receptor. Okay, so for alpha-1, noradrenaline has a greater affinity than adrenaline. So I'll abbreviate noradrenaline as NA, and I'll abbreviate adrenaline as ADR. Okay, so for alpha-1, basically noradrenaline is better at binding to alpha-1 than adrenaline is. For alpha-2, it's the other way around. Adrenaline is better at binding to alpha-2 than noradrenaline. Okay, for beta-1, they are both equal in affinity, so adrenaline's ability to bind to the beta-1 receptor is roughly the same as noradrenaline's ability to bind there. For beta-2, it's again that adrenaline is better at binding to the beta-2 receptor than uh, noradrenaline. And finally, for beta-3, it's then approximately equal that adrenaline uh, is as good at binding to the beta-3 receptor as noradrenaline. Okay, right. So, enough of that. Uh, let's turn our attention to heterotrimeric G proteins, okay, which is what these nine GPCRs are going to interact with, okay. So, we'll go a bit more general now. We'll go back to thinking of a general uh, G protein coupled receptor. So, let's draw a bit of plasma membrane here. So, here's a portion of plasma membrane. Then we've got a G protein coupled receptor here. And remember, all our G protein coupled receptors will have these characteristic seven membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. And uh, all of the adrenoceptors are. Um, rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors, which means that the ligand will bind to the transmembrane domain, okay? And it's the outer one-third of the transmembrane domain. Right, so what does the ligand then do? Well, when the ligand binds here, what will happen is it will trigger a conformational change in the structure of the receptor, okay? So the receptor will change conformation, and this conformational change will be relayed down to these special loops here that we have three of. Okay, now these are known as the intracellular loops, or the ICLs. So this is short for intracellular. IC is short for intracellular. And then the L is loop, okay? So you have three of these. You have intracellular loop one, which is this first one. Then you have the second intracellular loop, which is called ICL2. And then the third intracellular loop here, which is called ICL3. Okay. Now, basically, when the ligand binds, what will happen is it will cause a change in conformation of these three intracellular loops. And when they change conformation, they'll make available a binding site for the alpha subunit of a heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so we now want to look at the structure of a heterotrimeric G protein, and then we'll come back to it binding to this G protein coupled receptor. So I'll just label this up as the G protein coupled receptor. And you can think of it as an adrenoreceptor. And I should just say that adrenoreceptors are often abbreviated just to AR. So if, for instance, you wanted to talk about the beta-1 adrenoreceptor, what you would say is beta-1, and then you would put AR after it. Okay, it's nice to put the AR, so that just to clarify that you're talking about the adrenoreceptor. 
okay, because as we'll see, um, G protein couple receptors are going to have, sorry, G protein heterotrimeric G proteins are going to have beta 1 subunits, okay? So it is nice just to clarify that you mean the beta 1 adrenal receptor by putting AR. Usually, if you do just put beta 1, people will infer that you mean the beta 1 uh, adrenal receptor just because it's so famous. Um, but it's nice to put that clarification. Right, okay, so heterotrimeric G proteins then, that's a big, big name, okay? So these are uh, trimers, okay? So they consist of three separate proteins, and all of the proteins are different. That's what the hetero means. So it's a three subunit protein complex, and all of the subunits are different. So heterotrimeric G proteins. We've discussed that G protein means guanine nucleotide binding regulatory protein. Okay, I might even write that out for you. So this stands for, well, the G is short for guanine and then nucleotide and then binding regulatory, okay? So that's the full name for G proteins, that they are the guanine nucleotide binding regulatory proteins or just G proteins. Right, so let's have a look at heterotrimeric G proteins. So we'll start with the most important, uh, well, arguably the most important subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein, which is the alpha subunit. Although the other two subunits, it's emerging just how important those are. Okay, so this is going to be the alpha subunit of our heterotrimeric G protein here. Whoops, uh, so let me um, color this in in a nice color. So we'll have this in in red here. Okay, so alpha subunits uh, can be in two major states, okay? They can be in an on state where they have guanosine triphosphate bound to them, GTP, and they can be in an off state where they have guanosine diphosphate, or GDP, bound to them, okay? Now, in the off state, they can then associate with two other uh, proteins, two other heterotrimeric G protein subunits, the beta and the gamma subunit. So, let's say our alpha subunit is currently in the off state and has guanosine diphosphate bound to it, okay, GDP. Now, the other thing to say about these alpha subunits is what I've drawn here, okay? They basically have a lipid modification, a lipid moiety sticking off them, okay? Now, basically, what we have done is we have stuck on a long hydrophobic group onto the side of our protein. And what does that do? Well, basically, it latches, well, it uh, implants itself into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, and then sort of revels with the other hydrophobic groups in there, and uh, it's very favorable for it to sit in there. Now, what does that do? Well, that anchors this alpha subunit to the bottom of the plasma membrane, basically. It's now going to be attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. So that's actually how these alpha subunits are attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, because they have this uh, lipid moiety sticking off the side of them. Now, basically, the lipid moieties that you can get stuck on, and moiety just means group, basically, um, are meristic acid and palmitic acid, okay? Now, meristic acid is the old name for something that would now be called tetradecanoic acid, okay? But meristic acid is more common to hear biochemists uh, call it that rather than tetradecanoic acid. Tetradecanoic acid is a better name because it tells you exactly what you're dealing with here. It tells you that you are dealing with a 14-carbon, fully saturated carboxylic acid that is attached onto the side. The other option is that you put something called palmitic acid on. Okay, now palmitic acid, again, is an old biochemist's name. Uh, the more modern chemist's name would be to call this hexadecanoic acid, and again, that's a better name because it tells you exactly what you're dealing with instantly. It tells you you're dealing with a 16-carbon, fully saturated carboxylic acid, and these are going to be attached on by either amide links or thioester links. Okay, so the point is that they're attached on via their carboxylic acid groups onto the side of the protein, and then they have extremely long hydrophobic tails which implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Now, every single alpha subunit 
uh, and we're going to see that there are a lot of different types of alpha subunits, okay, just to warn you that that's coming up. Um, there are many different types of alpha subunits, uh, 21 in fact. Every single alpha subunit gets at least one lipid group stuck onto it. It either gets a myristic acid molecule stuck on or a palmitic acid molecule stuck on. Now some of them even get both stuck on, but most of them just get one of the one of these two stuck on. Okay, right. So the important thing to understand is that that is the reason that the alpha subunit is attached to the inner leaf foot of the phospholipid by there rather than is just floating around within the cytoplasm. Okay, and it's very important that it uh, is attached to the inner leaf foot of the phospholipid by there because otherwise, how is it to interact with the G protein coupled receptor? Okay, right. So this is the alpha subunit, and we've got GDP bound to it, so it's in the inactive state at the moment. Now, in the inactive state, it can associate with um, the other subunits of the heterotrimeric G protein, which are the beta subunit and the gamma subunit. Now, the beta and the gamma subunit never, ever, ever, under physiological circumstances, at least as far as we know, they never, ever break apart, okay? They have a very stable interaction. So people will often call the combination of the beta and the gamma subunit bound together, they'll call that the beta-gamma complex, and often people just call this the beta-gamma subunit, although specific um, you know, pedantically, it is actually made up of two separate subunits, the beta subunit and the gamma subunit. Okay, right, so let's colour those in. We'll colour in beta in blue, okay, and then we'll colour gamma in green. Okay, right. Now, um, another important thing to draw on here is that the gamma subunit also has a lipid moiety stuck onto the side of it. Okay, so it has a long hydrophobic molecule stuck stuck off the side of it, okay? And this again implants into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there and holds the beta-gamma complex at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Again, meaning that this will be nicely in position to take part in the signaling cascade, okay? Rather than just floating around in the cytoplasm. Okay, now the lipid moiety that the gamma subunit has uh, attached onto it is a little bit more complicated to explain the structure of the myristic acid and palmitic acid. Uh, it's something called a prenal group, and if you know what that means, great. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Uh, it's basically a polymer of isoprene. Well, an oligomer would be a better word than polymer. Okay, it's either made up of three isoprene molecules or four isoprene molecules. If it's three isoprene molecules, it's called a pharmazyl group. If it's a four isoprene molecules, it's called a geronal geronal group. Now, the important thing, however, to understand is that this is just a long hydrophobic molecule that implants into that hydrophobic core of the lipid by there and therefore holds the beta-gamma complex at the inner leaf of the phospholipid by there. Right. Okay, so... Basically, when the alpha subunit is in the off state, it is bound to GDP, and uh, when it has GDP bound to it, it then binds to the beta-gamma complex. So you therefore have this assembled heterotrimeric G protein. So the entire thing, then, is the heterotrimeric G protein. So let me circle the entire thing in orange here. And this entire thing is the heterotrimeric G protein. Right. Okay, so um, let's now see, before we go into the details of how many different heterotrimeric G proteins are, there are, and we are going to have to go into that, we're going to go into all the different alpha subunits, all the different beta and all the different gamma subunits. Before we go into that, I'm just going to tell you about um, how G proteins, heterotrimeric G proteins are activated by their G protein coupled receptor, okay? So we'll have the big picture before we go into the uh, minutiae. Right, okay, so basically um, the ligand binds to the G protein coupled receptor. That triggers a conformational change in the G protein coupled receptor that will be transferred down to these three intracellular loops. They will change conformation and they will make available a binding site for this alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein.
Okay, now I'm just going to fit this G protein coupled receptor around now, just because when I'm drawing the alpha subunit bound, it's annoying having this uh, carboxylic acid group in the way. Okay, so I'm just going to draw it this way around instead, like so. But it's the same thing that I'm drawing here. So here's the amino terminus up here, and then we have our carboxylic acid terminus here. Okay, right. And now what's going to happen is the alpha subunit is going to come and bind in here. Okay, like so. And it's important to understand that the alpha subunit can only bind if it's got the beta gamma complex with it. So although the beta gamma complex itself does not actually bind to the inner aspect of the G protein coupled receptor, if the beta gamma complex is not bound to the alpha subunit, the alpha subunit cannot bind to the G protein coupled receptor. Okay, now what's the condition for the alpha subunit to have the beta gamma complex with it? Well, it's that the alpha subunit has GDP bound to it. The beta gamma complex can only bind to the alpha subunit if it's got GDP here, i.e. if it's off. And of course, the lipid moiety of the alpha subunit will still be there. So let's try and colour this in to make it look simpler. Okay, so here's the alpha subunit in red here. Okay, and it's still in the off state. It's still got GDP bound to it. And then the beta gamma subunit is still associated with this alpha subunit because the alpha subunit is still in the off state. Okay, and the presence of the beta gamma subunit is the only reason that this alpha subunit can actually bind to that inner aspect of the G protein coupled receptor. Without it, the alpha subunit can't bind there. And I also would just like to highlight the lipid moieties up. So we've still got that lipid moiety there and that lipid moiety there attaching the heterotrimeric G protein uh, to the um, inner leaf sort of the phospholipid by there. Now, what happens next is that the binding of this alpha subunit to the internal aspect of the G protein coupled receptor, uh, which should have a ligand bound to it. So let me just stick in the ligand here. Okay, so that's the ligand in blue, right? Uh, what that causes is it causes the release of the guanosine diphosphate from the alpha subunit. And by the way, this is why it's called a guanine nucleotide binding uh, regulatory protein, because they bind guanine nucleotides. They bind guanosine diphosphate and guanosine triphosphate, which are guanine nucleotides. Okay, and basically the guanosine diphosphate is given up and a molecule of guanosine triphosphate from the cytoplasm will come and bind here instead. Okay, now the instant that guanosine triphosphate binds there, what will happen? The beta gamma complex will break away. Okay, so it can't interact with the alpha subunit once it's got guanosine triphosphate there. Okay, so the beta gamma complex goes off, and then what happens? Well, without the beta gamma complex, the alpha subunit can't bind to the inner aspect of the G protein coupled receptor, so it falls off the G protein coupled receptor too. And the overall result of this then is that you have wandering around in your plasma membrane now free beta gamma complexes. Okay, which have now broken away from their alpha subunits. Okay, so here's the beta subunit, here's the gamma subunit, and I'll color those in our uh, characteristic colors. So here, beta is in blue, and gamma is in green. And then you now also have the free alpha subunit as well, which has now guanosine triphosphate, GTP, bound to it. So here's the alpha subunit here. Okay. Uh, which now has GTP bound to it. And both of these will now go down and have signaling effects, okay? So both of them will go off and interact with targets. So let's just colour in the alpha subunit in red here. So, basically, I now want to show their targets because this is quite important because we also need to now look at how the signal turns itself off, okay? We need to complete the G protein cycle. Okay, so... Basically, the alpha subunit over here will have some downstream targets, so let's call this target 1, okay? And also, the beta gamma complex will have targets 2, so I'll put the beta gamma complex, a target over here, okay? So this is target 2. Right, 
Uh, so they'll go off and bind to things that will be in or at least attached to the um, plasma membrane because otherwise how can they get to them because they themselves are latched to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, uh, and basically when the alpha subunit binds to its target, what happens is that the alpha subunit itself is activated. So the alpha subunit binding to this target one will have effects on the target, of course. It will activate the target potentially, or inactivate it, or regulate it in some way. Um, but the binding of the alpha subunit to the target actually also activates the alpha subunit. Now, what does that mean? Well, basically, alpha subunits are all enzymes, okay? They are all enzymes that have the ability uh, to hydrolyze GTP. So this alpha subunit here, it's actually an enzyme, it can break down GTP into GDP and an inorganic phosphate. So basically the alpha subunit is a GTPase. It hydrolyzes GTP to GDP and an inorganic phosphate. Okay. However, it's usually not active. It becomes active when it binds to the target. So when it binds to the target, the alpha subunit will become activated. It will gain its GTPase activity, and then it will hydrolyze GTP into GDP and inorganic phosphate. The inorganic phosphate will then be released. The GDP will stay bound to the alpha subunit. And now, once you have then got that alpha GDP reformed, Basically, it will cleave away from target, okay? So it will cleave away from target one, and the reason is that the alpha subunit can only interact with its targets when it's in the on state, i.e. when it's got GTP bound. So once it's turned itself off and has GDP bound, it can no longer interact with its targets, okay? What can it interact with again now? It can interact with the beta-gamma complex. So it will scour around, it will whiz around in the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane until it finds the beta-gamma complex again, and then it will nick it off its target, okay? So it will break the beta-gamma complex off from target two, and it will rebind it, basically, to reform the heterotrimeric G protein back again. And this cycle where we go from uh, the inactive heterotrimeric G protein all the way back to the uh, heterotrimeric G protein here, uh, this is known as the G protein cycle. Okay, so here in blue is the beta subunit, and here in green is the gamma subunit. And this is the G protein cycle that we've just studied now. Okay, right. So what we now want to turn our attention to is the diversity of the subunits for heterotrimeric G proteins, because there is a huge amount of diversity in the subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Uh, so we'll look at all the different alpha subunits, all the different beta subunits, and all the different gamma subunits, just so that we have a full understanding of this um, system. Then what we'll do is go on to uh, looking at the pathways triggered by each of the different uh, families of adrenoreceptors. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video and continue our discussion in the next video.